Let's sing Unmatched in all your wisdom. Unmatched in all your wisdom, in love and justice you will reign. Oh, and every knee will bow. We bring our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name. Oh, the name of Jesus. turn to someone this morning and say, welcome to church, and uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. 
together today. We're going to celebrate his triumph over the grave, his triumph over the powers of sin. We're going to declare today that our God can do anything. Let's sing in faith. Here we go. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus our God. Come on, you know what we say. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall From Psalm 126, and it's called a Psalm of Ascent. And as I just as I speak this psalm today, I just if you're coming to church broken today, if you're coming to church in a place of um, just needing healing today, I want this I want this psalm to come straight from the heart of the Father to you today. So it's Psalm 126, and it says, "When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy." Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping and carrying seed to sow will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. And so this morning, church, some of you might be coming here just down today. Some of you might just be in that place where, with God, where you're, you're, you're struggling with him, and you're struggling with why, why am I here, what's going on, and I just want this verse today to just speak straight from his heart, to say his heart for you is healing and redemption, his heart for you is to, you may be down now, but he will raise you up, so this morning, just, I want us to hear that, we're going to sing about that today as we respond, amen, church? Singing hallelujah. 
just this morning, uh, we got to engage with him this morning. He's our king. He's conquered the grave. And we're just going to engage his heart this morning. So if you have a song to sing, if you just want to go to him in prayer, uh, we're just going to wait for the Holy Spirit right now. We're going to let the Holy Spirit be our worship leader in this place today. Just lift 
up your praise to the King. Lift up your voice in song. Lift up your hands in praise. Lift up your heart in joy today. Lift up your voice in song. Lift up your hands in praise. Lift up your heart in joy. He's worthy, so worthy we sing. And we sing, we sing out. Then we sing, holy is your name. And we sing, then we sing. help us today to lift up Jesus because he's the one who lifts us up. We've not come to strengthen ourselves or to exalt ourselves. We've come to exalt you. 
Let your name be on our lips. Let your name be glorified in this place. Because we know you are here. We thank you for your presence, and we thank you for the work you are doing right now in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys sound pretty good this morning. A few flags in the air didn't bother you, did it? That's pretty good. You may be seated this morning, just real quickly. Uh, inside of your bulletin is a slip of paper. It is a connection card. If you can just take a moment, pull it out, and fill it out, it's a great help to us. And at the end of the service, you can turn that in when the offering container goes by. Um, just before I dismiss uh, uh, kits, just a reminder, actually most of our students are away today at a retreat. So if you are a student in the room and you're not on that retreat, you're going to stay in the auditorium with us this morning because all of the teachers and the rest of the students are away. So while you're completing that assignment with the cards, we'll go ahead and release children for Children's Church. I think most of us suffer with a similar illusion, and maybe it's a delusion, and that is that the world would be better if we were in control. Um, the truth is, what's wrong with the world is that we are in control. And it's actually when God is in control that things look a lot better. If you want to know how we get hell on earth, it's when people are running things. And what makes heaven heaven is people don't run things there. God's will is always accomplished there. So if we want to have earth look a little more like heaven, we have to learn to invite God's will and God's ways into our world. And here's the thing about God's will and God's ways. It always is extended through invitation. Our world is not good about this. We try to manipulate people. If that doesn't work, we try to intimidate people, and then we try to impose things on people. And the kingdom of God never advances by imposing anything on anyone. It's always by invitation. The Holy Spirit is very much like every other member of the Trinity. And we're going to talk today, start a series about spiritual gifts and serving. And it's called Unlocking Your Potential. And so this morning, I want us to think about things that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. And you should know that he is very generous, just like God the Father is generous, who gave his son, and Jesus is generous, who gave his life. The Holy Spirit is generous. And there are lots of works that the Holy Spirit does that Scripture identifies and talks about for us. For example, he exalts Jesus. He convicts us of sin. He regenerates us. He seals believers. He guides us. He prompts us. He reveals truth to us. All of those are things that he does. Today, I want to look at two very specific works of the Spirit, and I think that it will help us understand our role in God's kingdom in the day we live in and in the culture we live in. And the first is this, is that the Holy Spirit provides the gift of assurance. The gift of assurance. In Romans, the eighth chapter, it says this, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are his children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. The Holy Spirit comes to assure us of who we are. 
That word assure means that you are being sure of who you are. It's a guarantee that you actually belong to God. It will make you secure in your relationship. If you've ever seen anyone who's insecure in their relationships, it's a very difficult thing to watch because they don't act in healthy ways. The reason that Christians don't act in healthy ways is because they become insecure in their relationship with God. When the Holy Spirit does his work in us, it increases our confidence. But our confidence is not in ourselves. Our confidence is in God. Now, a lot of religion in the world is based on a fear model. And fear is very powerful. It's, it's intimidating and it's manipulating. But Paul confronts the notion that Christianity should be a fear-based religion. He says that when you have accepted the work of the Spirit in your life, it actually drives fear out. And you're no longer a slave to fear. Because that's what fear does. Fear makes slaves out of people. The work of the Holy Spirit does something much different. So, the Holy Spirit has come to assure us that we are children of God. This is not something that you earn. It's not like you pass a test and, and you say, there, I've proven that I'm a child of God. Uh, it's not a, a time thing. If you hang around the church for a certain amount of time, you automatically become a child of God. This is a work of the Spirit. And he has come to assure us that we are the children of God. Now, here's the thing. When you place your faith in Christ, God deposited his Holy Spirit within you. And that work of the Spirit is vital. It's essential. And it reminds, he reminds us that we belong to Christ and that what Christ has done for us is sufficient for us. Scripture teaches us that when you place your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit abides in you. So if you have placed your faith in Christ, this is the good news for every one of you in the room this morning. If you've placed your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit already abides in you. How many think that's cool? How many think that's spooky? I don't know if you want that or not. But here's the thing. There are people who are satisfied with the concept of forgiveness. That they belong to God and their faults and failures have been forgiven. And their assumption is, is that anything else of the resources of heaven other than forgiveness are not really available to us now. That we have to wait until we get to heaven for those things. Now, uh, some of you have had parents in your life that uh, told you you could be anything you wanted to be. But a lot more of us have had parents that uh, saw our limitations and maybe even saw their own limitations and imposed them on us. You are more than what your parents told you you are. You are more than what a teacher in school told you you are. You are more than what an angry friend or a jealous neighbor told you you are. You are a child of the living God. You are a king and a priest in this world. You are not a loophole of grace. You did not get in when God wasn't looking. You are part of God's strategic mission in this world. You are not an accident. He has not placed you where you are by accident. He has placed you where you are as an agent of his grace. He's been strategic, deliberate, and intentional about where you are. And God has placed his Holy Spirit within us so that we are sure that we belong to him. Now, here's the challenge. There are some of us, in fact, all of us at some point or another, will have doubts. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you've had doubts because I don't want to make liars out of some people in the room. The simple truth, we all have moments when we doubt. There are things that are so surprisingly fantastic in Scripture, we wonder if it can be true. There are times when we go through such painful trials, we wonder that if the resources of God's grace are still available to us. There are times when we will have questions and we will have doubts. The assurance of our salvation doesn't eliminate all doubt. The assurance of our salvation comes back and reminds us in the face of our doubt that we still belong to Christ. Now, for some, the only work of the Spirit 
that they're really aware of or interested in is this work of assurance. But Jesus actually promised that the Holy Spirit would do something else that's very significant in our lives. The second work I want to talk about today is the gift of empowerment. So there's the gift of assurance. You know who you are. And then there's the gift of empowerment. And this has to do with what we do. In Acts, the first chapter, verses 7 and 8, it says, Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times and the dates the Father has already set by his own authority. Now, they asked him, are you going to set up your kingdom at this time? And Jesus responds by saying, it's not for you to know the times or dates. It's not for you to know. Then he goes on. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, many Christians spend a great deal of time trying to figure out the times and the dates of God's agenda. They try to find the clues in Scripture that identify what is going to happen next and when it's going to happen. And Jesus insisted that that information is not essential for us to be able to live out God's purpose for our lives. Now, since God himself will not give us this information, we should be aware that anyone who claims to have that information is just using speculation. That's why there are people throughout the course of history that have predicted days that Jesus was going to return for his church. And so far, without exception, every one of them had been wrong. And there are people who predict who the Antichrist is going to be. And so far, they have been wrong. And there are people who try to, they go through and they find these really challenging and difficult to understand passages of scripture and they look for clues as to when it might happen and Jesus actually tells his disciples that's not essential information for you. The purpose of prophecy is not to calculate the timing of God. The purpose of prophecy is that when things are overwhelming in our world that you will know that he is still in control because he foretold that all of this would happen. What he does say is that we are to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Don't waste your time trying to figure out when something is going to happen. Start asking God what you should be doing. We're asking when questions when we should be asking what questions. By the way, a lot of us get stuck on why questions too. Why is this happening? Here's a phrase I'd like you to get used to saying. Ready? I don't know. Let's all try it together. I don't know. There's some of you that can't say it, can you? It's just, I don't know. We don't feel comfortable saying that. There's lots of things that we don't know. Christians get bogged down when we ask when, and Christians get bogged down when we ask why. But Christians are at least to do the most amazing and astonishing things in our world when we ask what. What do you want me to do where I am? Those are powerful questions to begin to ask. And that's how the Holy Spirit is released into our life. So the Holy Spirit has come to do things with us, not for us. He's come to empower us. Now, I don't do a lot of cooking in our house, and there's reasons for that. I'm not the worst cook in the world. I have a very limited repertoire, though. There's about three things that I do. And uh, I can make it sound a lot better than it actually is. Uh, but nobody has ever died from my cooking. But most meals, I actually don't prepare. I walk into the house, and they're prepared for me. And by the way, God didn't send angels from heaven to prepare those meals for me. They're prepared by my wife. And my wife is a much better cook than I am. And when I go to a restaurant, how many are glad when you go to a restaurant, they don't usher you into the kitchen and you have to make your own food? Aren't you glad about that? You just, they, they, it's prepared for you. And there are lots of people who think that this is what the kingdom of God is like, that you receive the Holy Spirit, and then he just takes care of things for you. The meals are all prepared for you. The work is all done for you. That you just kind of walk into the room and people say things like, what must I do to be saved? And, and you just, you don't even have to pray for anybody to ever get healed or encouraged or filled. The Holy Spirit just does that, and we just kind of observe it and applaud what he's done. That is not how it works. The Holy Spirit does not do things for us. The Holy Spirit empowers us so that he can do things with us, or more correctly, that we can do things with him. 
Now, here's the thing. He wants us to take action. And there are some people who believe that if you're empowered by the Spirit, you will feel almost invulnerable. Does anybody remember back to the days when you were young enough to feel invulnerable? Yeah? Anybody ever do some really stupid stuff? I did a few stupid things, particularly on mountains with snow skis, because I thought I was invulnerable. Turns out that was not true. I figured that out the very first day on a slope. I was young, I was in college, and I thought, it's snow, it's soft, what can go wrong? I broke a ski, I lost a ski, and I dislocated my right knee. And then I decided that I needed to be really careful when I was on the slopes. There are Christians who they act like they're invulnerable. My observation is when people act overconfident or invulnerable, they're not known for their graciousness. They get frustrated with other people. They get annoyed with that people's confidence levels aren't the same as theirs. When the Holy Spirit works through us, he does not make us invulnerable. He makes us actually humble because we realize how much of what is happening is not based on our ability, but on God's ability. There's a lot of humility that goes along with the work of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit wants to empower you to pray beyond your understanding, to pray beyond your understanding. Now, um, here's another challenge that we face. Remember I told you one of the illusions that we have is if we were in control, that the world would be better off. Here's another illusion that we have, that we actually know and understand what's going on in our lives, in the lives of those we love, and in our world. And just like I had us all practice a little bit ago about stuff we didn't know, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. In fact, look at this passage of scripture. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Let's just underline that passage of scripture if you have your notes out. We do not know what we should pray for as we ought. I think this is indicating that even when we think we know what we should pray for, we probably don't understand everything there is to pray for. I mean, there's times when people have asked me to pray about things, and I have no clue what God wants to do in that situation. There's other times when I'm pretty sure I have an idea of what God wants to do, or I'm always sure I have an idea of what I want to see done in that. Does anybody else try to give you your to-do list to God? Just say, if you would just do this by this date, everything would be wonderful. But the truth is this, is that we often do not know. The, our assumption is not accurate. The question is not, do I ever not know? The question is, do we ever really know how we should pray as we ought? And then he goes on to say this. But the Spirit himself makes intercession, what's the next two words? For us, with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. This is what scripture tells us, that the Holy Spirit always knows exactly what to pray. He's part of the Trinity. He knows the heart and the mind of God. He knows what's going on in our worlds. He knows our hearts because he abides in us. He understands everything that's going on. So he knows what to pray, and we don't know what to pray. So the question becomes, how can you pray or allow the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit to intercede for us. How, how does this process actually work? And it's actually, it seems complicated. It's actually a lot easier than you can imagine. What it said in that passage of scripture is that God is even able to intercede for us through sighs and groans. How many here has ever sighed? Let's all practice the sigh together, ready? When do you tend to sigh? Most of the time, it's when things are not going the way we want them to. I heard a phenomenal message one time by a, a woman in a leadership uh, setting where she talked uh, the ministry of size, and she talked about all the size of Jesus in Scripture, everywhere it said that he sighed. And she, it was just a phenomenal teaching. It was very impressive. 
sigh, and groans. Has anybody here ever groaned? You know, sometimes we groan because we're in pain. Sometimes we groan because things are not going the way we want. Does anybody have, so, how many here, you don't so much groan, it's more like a growl. It's, <laughs> Yeah, the, the Bible doesn't actually say that he, he intercedes for us through our growls, but it, it, he does intercede for us through our groans. And even beyond that, there's something that the Holy Spirit does, and that is the spiritual language that he can, he can engage us in and that he can use to pray the perfect will of God. Now, throughout Christian history, there's been a little bit of controversy over this, though not for most of Christian history. It's been something more related to about the last hundred years. This idea that the Holy Spirit can actually give you a syllable or a word or a phrase or a paragraph that are made of words you do not know the meaning of, and yet the Holy Spirit is praying the perfect will of God through them. Now, one of the reasons we feel uncomfortable with this is back to our first illusion that we have to be in control. Another reason that we're uncomfortable with this is because we think if we don't understand a thing, it's not understandable. The third reason we struggle with this is basically this, and that is we assume that God can explain to us the situation and then we would understand it. If you've ever had really little children I don't know about your kids, but my kids, when they were little, they would ask a lot of why questions. Anybody else? And eventually, you just get to, because I said so. Now, that works when they're little. By the time they get bigger, that's a really hard line to use, and it doesn't work very well. But there's just things a five-year-old won't understand. You can try to explain it. They just don't understand certain concepts. They don't understand certain influences. They don't understand certain cause and effects. There's lots that they don't understand. So if you try to explain it to them, you can take all day and you can use every word that comes to your mind and they just don't get it because they're not able to understand all that's going on. They're not there yet. Here's what we need to understand. When we compare ourselves with God, there's lots that we don't understand and we're not there yet. And God does not want to limit our praying to our own ability. He wants us to be able to pray beyond our ability. So he gives us this ability to pray in words that we have not actually learned. Paul talked about it this way in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. He said, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. He's saying, when I use these words, I have no idea what they mean. So he, he kind of gives us a balance here. He says, so I'm not going to just pray those words I, I don't understand all the time. He says, I will pray in my spirit, and I will pray with my understanding also. He even says he will sing with spiritual words, and he will sing with his understanding also. That the Holy Spirit can give us words that we have not learned that perfectly pray the will of God, even though we don't always understand exactly what that is. The Holy Spirit also desires, desires to help us discern what more than what we can see. So he wants to help us pray beyond our understanding. He wants us to be able to discern more than we can see. This is what he says in Ephesians, the first chapter. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. God wants us to see more than we can see with our natural eyes. There are things that God desires and hopes for us that is so hard for us to imagine or believe that we can't see it. But the Holy Spirit begins to inspire us to be able to see those things. He also helps us to understand and see forces that are at work behind the scenes that are not good forces. They're evil forces. Now, we often attribute most of our problems in life to flesh and blood. That's why we blame people. Our problem is those people. And if those people would get out of the way, if those people would leave me alone, if those people were not involved, then my life would be easier. You don't understand how God says the world actually works, that there are people who are being influenced by forces that they don't understand. And if all we do is wrestle against people, and blame people. We never actually resolve any issues in our lives. 
Paul talked about that in Ephesians 6, chapter 2. He says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're fighting not enemies of flesh and blood, but we're fighting evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world and against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places that the Holy Spirit can give us words to pray that actually not only completely understand what's going on in our lives, but help us to discern more than what we can see. And he also gives us the capacity to discern his promptings to act. I was in India, and I was with a pastor who was not used to anything modern. Most of India is a very rural place. And I was literally in villages where uh, they're outside of cars that you would bring in. They still used animals to transport all their stuff. There was no technology. They barely had electricity. It was like going back in time. In fact, in one city that I went into, one village I went into, I was the first white person they had seen, and they would come up and they would rub my face to see if the white would come off. And that gets old after a while, just so you know. And, and uh, so we took this pastor to a mall that had an escalator. And I'll never forget it. He stood there and he looked at those stairs going up, and he went, We were all upstairs. We found a place to sit down. It took him 15 minutes. And I was scared once he got on if he was going to be able to get off. And then when it came time to get back, come back down, I thought maybe he had learned. Nope. <laughs> he did not. Now, it's easy for me to make fun of that, right? Except I discovered, I, I used all forms of transportation when I was in India. I rode on camels, I rode in ox carts, I rode on buses, I rode on motorcycles, I rode on, on scooters, I rode in these little uh, motorized tricycles, I rode in cars, I, you, you name it, I was in it. And the thing about the buses in India that they don't tell you is they don't always stop for you. You have to run and jump on them while they're moving. And so the guy who had trouble with the stairs, <laughs> He was behind me, and he, and he says, the bus is coming. I said, good. He says, you're going to have to start running now. I said, what? <laughs> he said, you have to start running now. I said, doesn't the bus stop? He said, nope, the bus does not stop when you get on. It only stops when you get off. I said, you've got to be kidding me. And he said, no. And he says, you've got to start moving now. Or we're going to miss the bus. So I started running, and I jumped on the bus, and I made it. And I just stood there so proud of myself. I had run and jumped on a moving bus. And then all of a sudden, I hear the pastor behind me yelling, you have to go up the stairs, you have to go up the stairs. Because he was still running, and he needed to get on the bus, too. <laughs> There's lots of things we don't know and we don't understand. And something as simple as knowing when to put your foot down so that you go up. We have our own agenda, and it's very hard for us to submit to God's agenda. And God has a way of interrupting our thoughts and giving us an action step that makes all the difference in our lives and our world. And sometimes we're so afraid of it, we're like the person at the escalator. And we're just, I don't know, should I do it? Is it me? Is it God? I don't know. Should I, what if it doesn't work? And we, we get very anxious about those things. But the more you learn to submit to those promptings of the Spirit, the more you begin to understand that God works amazing things through our lives. And he wants us to be naturally supernatural. You see, being spirit-led is not a show. It's not about calling attention to ourselves. Have you ever seen some of those preachers on TV when they pray for people? They don't just pray for people. They knock them down. You ever, you ever see them? Have you ever seen preachers on TV when they talk to you? They don't just talk to you. They yell. Have you ever seen him? Um, by the way, I come from a long tradition of, of praying for people and they would fall down and yelling for preaching. That's not an uncommon um, experience because I was raised in that. And what I will tell you about most of those people, that's actually their personality. I've met some of those people 
And they're not like one person behind the pulpit or in the camera and another person when they're someplace else. They are loud and they are vibrant and they are demonstrative wherever they are. I mean, when they pour their Cheerios, they do it differently than anybody else. They just, everything is big. Does anybody have a relative like that? You know, we used to have more people in the culture like that than we do now. Everybody's kind of conformed and confined. But back in the day, I had a couple uncles I wouldn't want to introduce to anybody. Um, we ran into one of our uncles at Letchworth one day. I had my parents with us, and, they, and, and he scared my parents to death. He just, he's loud and proud and came running at us, and I didn't recognize him because he'd shaved his beard, and I didn't know who he was right away. But when he started yelling, I recognized the voice, and, and I recognized the language. And uh, <laughs> I said, oh, that's, that's uncle. Um, my mother, who has a heart condition, almost had a heart attack right then. But it's not about us having to do things a certain way. Jesus uses you and your personality. He's not asking us to put on a show or pretend anything. See, in Christ, we're given the presence of the Holy Spirit that affirms that we are children of God, but we're also given the power of the Holy Spirit to extend God's kingdom through us wherever we go. See, salvation prepares you for heaven. That's what the grace of forgiveness and God's grace does in our prepares us for heaven. But the gift of, the, of spirit fullness equips you for the earth. There are still things that God wants to do here. So the question becomes, how do you receive this spirit empowerment or spirit enablement? It's the same way that you received your salvation. You asked God to forgive you, and you placed your faith in Christ based on what he had done on his cross. And that began the process of his spirit being deposited in your life and that assurance coming to you. If you want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, it has to be based on faith in Christ, not faith in ourselves. The Holy Spirit does not empower us because we are better than anybody else. In fact, I am often embarrassed by the people that the Holy Spirit empowers. I would choose different people, and that's part of the problem. We will constantly disqualify ourselves because we're not as good as somebody else. Place your faith in Christ. He's the one who empowers you. And here's the other thing. You might not have a really powerful feeling about this. I've had some people, when they were empowered by the Spirit, they felt very emotional. I have had other people, when they were empowered by the Spirit, they didn't feel any emotion at all. The infilling of the Spirit is not about an emotion or a feeling. It may or may not happen. That's not the purpose of it. It's not the same for everybody. Does anybody here, are you a little bit on the emotional side anyway? Anybody here kind of tear up easy? Like, I tear up at, at the easiest things. It just drives me nuts. Because I grew up in a culture where if you were male, you didn't cry. And the tears just flow easy for me. Sometimes, I would, just the other day, back here in the office, I was talking with a couple of uh, our staff, and, and I, I was quoting the lyrics from a song. Not even a Christian song, just a song. It actually had to do with a song about my daughter getting married. And I didn't even get through a whole verse, and I'm tearing up. And then I saw another one tear up, and I go, ha! You have a daughter too, don't you? This is how that works. The emotion is not the most important thing. It's about an ability that God deposits in you if you're willing to receive it. And here's what I want you to know. Uh, what I'm about to talk to you now, nobody ever has to do. It's only just available from the Spirit of God to aid you and to assist you. You don't ever have to do it. It doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is not in you, and it doesn't mean that God thinks less of you, and it doesn't mean that you're not going to heaven. It doesn't mean any of those things. But I honestly do believe that part of what happens when the Holy Spirit empowers us is that he gives us the ability to pray beyond our understanding, and he can give us words, syllables, 
And sometimes they grow into phrases and sentences and paragraphs. And sometimes it seems awkward. And here's the thing, I've seen people struggle with this. I, I had a person one time, they wanted to be prayed for to receive spiritual language. And so I prayed for them. And this is what they did. They opened their mouth and they thought it was going to come out like a radio. And that's not how it works. It's your voice. It's your mouth. It's your teeth. It's your tongue that the Holy Spirit is using. But he's giving you words you don't understand. And you say them, not because it makes you better than somebody else, you say them because you honestly believe that he uses those words to pray things we don't understand. It's a very powerful way to pray. And it does become more natural to you over time. This is what I will tell you, is that for every person, it takes faith to speak those words out. Another thing that I've noticed is that the Holy Spirit can give us brief mental images. Just in, it, It's like a little picture of something to help us understand what it is we're praying about. The Bible says in Acts, the second chapter, that he would give visions and dreams. These are mental images to help us better understand what is going on. You see, spirit, uh, spirit empowerment makes you more aware of what God wants to do. It makes you more aware of what God is doing. And it makes you more aware of what God wants you to do. And just like salvation is available to everyone, the empowerment of his spirit is available to everyone. Now, it's only by invitation. God offers it. He doesn't require it of us. He doesn't punish us if we don't accept it. It's not how the kingdom of God works. It's just available. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, our lives are complicated. A lot of times we think we know what the solution is and we're mistaken. A lot of times we can't even imagine what a solution would be for some of the challenges that we're facing. This is what I know. I know our world is filled with darkness and great pain. I know that there are forces that seek to bring destruction at every level from personal to national. And I know that your grace still abounds in the world, not because we've earned it or deserve it, but because you love us so much. I'm asking that you would give every person in this room the courage to trust you to empower them. I honestly believe you've not just called us to wait until we get to heaven to make a difference. I think you want to empower us with your spirit to make a difference right here, right now. And so for every person in this room who desires to be empowered by your spirit, I ask that you would do that for them. And as just as sure as you give us an assurance of our salvation, I ask that you give us an assurance of that empowerment. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? You 
you've been taught that if you ask God for something like that you could get something that's bad and I would just like to encourage you with the words of Jesus himself if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children for example if they ask for bread would you give them a stone if they ask for fish would you give them a serpent and he says absolutely not if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Now, this is what I want you to understand. If you ask God, I believe this completely, if you ask God for the gift of His Holy Spirit to empower you, you've already received that gift for assurance of who you are, but to empower you, I believe God makes it His business to make sure you don't get anything evil. Once you ask him, he's going to make sure whatever comes to you is good because he is a good, good father. You may be seated this morning. Father, for our gifts that we return to your hands today, we ask your blessing. We ask that you would help us use them in ways that would honor you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Ensuring there will be no bluegrass music at the <laughs> membership class on, on Saturday. And by the way, if you, uh, membership class doesn't mean you're committed to being a member, you're just exploring the concept of membership here. Different churches have different ideas about what that looks like, and we just want you to be aware of what that looks like here. So if you're interested, please make sure you call the church office. We can be prepared for you. If I can have elders come forward. Um, elders are available to stand and pray with you, maybe even to agree with you in prayer that you would receive that empowerment of the Holy Spirit this morning. We want you to know that that's always available here. Father, thank you for your grace and your gifts, and we walk in confidence of who you are and who you're making us to be. We thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I You are.